Good evening and welcome to Truth and Justice TV. My name's Jennifer Obasaki and today we are going to be talking all about family law. My very special guest is one of my lovely colleagues and her name is Mrs. Vivian Akibajo. Good evening Viv. Good evening Jane. You're not allowed to call her Viv, I only call her Viv. But Vivian Akimbajo is one of our main assets in our family team. We have our supervisor, Miss Folashide, who some of you have met before on some of the other programs. But today, Viv and I are going to be talking about family law. Now, during this pandemic, people have been in the same households together. Some have bonded and some have realised that it's not going to be forever after. <laughs> So dealing with the situation of relationship up and down, relationship turbulence, mediation, separation, and what to do in those circumstances is what we're going to be talking about today. So welcome to Truth and Justice, Viv. Thank you. And for those people who think, okay, what does Viv do at Obasiki Solicitors? What do you do at Obasiki Solicitors? Um, at Obasiki Solicitors, I, my main area of practice is in family law. Um, housing and litigation. Right. Now, when it comes down to family law, some of the common issues that people think about, you know, or come in and ask you about, what would you say are the main issues that people deal with or have issues over? Divorce, separation, domestic violence issues. Okay. And your clients, do they, are they individuals, male, female, or are they a mix? Oh, yeah, mix most times. Okay, so issues around family don't affect one particular gender, affects both men and women. And it also means that as organizations, sometimes you may need to seek help for your members, for your clients, and that might be churches, mosques, and charities. And we receive uh, instructions from all of the above. We even receive instructions from children. <laughs> so when it comes down to separation, what are the main issues around separation that people come and talk about? Um, they usually come to talk about um, dissemination of properties, um, child arrangements, um, issues in the home, and usually we would advise people to try and see if they can settle these issues within themselves mm. before going the next step. So before people get divorced, first of all, you have to be married for at least one year. You have to try. <laughs> you can't just sit down and say, we don't do it again. <laughs> We're not, we don't want to have it, this marriage anymore. You have to try. And you have to go through the mediation process unless you can cite reasons why you should be exempt. And that, that might be reasons such as domestic violence. It might be a, a, a fact that one party is not willing. Uh, for mediation to take place, both parties have to be willing participants. And there should be an independent person and when it comes down to mediation, I always recommend that couples go to independent persons, so not necessarily people that know both of them, because there might be that, um, un, you know, indirect way of taking sides or judging, and people might be shy to talk in front of people that know them. And there's the, also the issue of confidentiality. It's important you have a professional mediator. If you're going to do it properly, do it properly. And then when it comes down to mediation and not working, if couple can agree and there's no issue, file for divorce, is it straightforward? Many people are worried about cost and time. What can you say about cost and time? I would say usually if you go through mediation and if you have a good mediator acting for you, it could be cheaper to go through that route. If you guys, if you couple, if the couple parties agree, they could agree on a consent order just to ensure that the um, decisions they've made is enforceable or it's carried out duly. So there's no person backing out or changing their changing minds their and minds things like that. From what so was agreed people, in mediation, yeah. yeah. Because people usually will do and say, oh, I never agreed on that term. I never agreed on this term. Right. I agreed to have a child. I've changed my mind. So we usually encourage people to go through the normal rules. And once you agree on anything, you agree on a consent order which we would if you're going through the next year, submit to court for the court to be aware that this arrangement has been in place okay so mediation works you've ironed out who gets what um it's all done with both parties agreeing to it write it down goes to court a consent order 
but when it goes wrong <laughs> what happens so can't agree one person might have not taken part in mediation what next to have to go to court yes yeah, so court ancillary relief is the financial element and some people get deterred especially if there's assets abroad uh, that need to be valued if there's acrimony and you know you've already suffered a level of emotional trauma it can be stressful and we appreciate that fully but it's always best to put it over to the hands of professionals and try and make sure that you get what is considered duly yours and fair. Um, I was going to say, what are the main grounds for divorce? So what are the grounds for divorce? So um, for you to be able to um, go to court to have a divorce, you've got to be at least married for, you know, a year. And, and you, you've got to be at least you, sh you have to prove to the court that the marriage has broken down permanently. There are various grounds also that you have to prove. There's the, the desertion. You've got to prove that the person, your, your spouse or your partner has deserted you for some time, at least two years. Mm -hmm. There's adultery. You prove that you, you have evidence that your, your partner has committed adultery with someone else outside the marriage. And then there's a separation. You may have separated for like two years or five years and then there's unreasonable behavior and that unreasonable behavior has a lot of things underneath yeah it can't just through. be you've you're not talking no. or somebody's not washing the dishes it has to be yeah. real unreasonable behavior and sometimes people might bicker over that's not so true things, that's yes. true but the main thing you've got to get down to is has this marriage broken down irrevocably, as in we can't come back from where we are, there's no saving this. So if you've done the mediation, you've realized it's broken down irrevocably, this is only for people who've reached that conclusion that it can't work. So um, how, long, how long and how much? Some people will stay away from filing, they reach the decision, it's, it's broken down, but nobody files because nobody wants to pay the court fee. <laughs> is, that, is that a reasonable or wise thing to do? Um, usually the, the courts would encourage people or you know the law would encourage people to give themselves time to see if they will be able to come back together or not so it's advisable if they give themselves space but if they know they're not going back then one of the parties can go ahead and file you know, so you've got a court fee to pay and it is not that expensive think about paying towards a resolution and paying towards a new start and that's what you've got to think about some people may be exempt from court fees may be able to apply for help with fees from court and now that there's the online process how quickly can this be concluded from well, start to finish it could be between six to eight months at most um, and this is usually because of the covid okay. period but we do have issues presently where because of the carry the backlog of cases during the covid period they do have occasions where the court could give three months date mm -hmm. for any hearing if there's if the, if the matter is being defended by the other party if it's so being defended if it's so if, if somebody's challenging the grounds for the divorce yeah. and it's defended it could, take it could take longer but all in all you could be thinking about concluding the whole process of you having your decree nisi and decree absolute within the space of six to eight months but the issue of ancillary relief may take longer because if there's a lot of assets to be divided, things to be assessed in Ghana, Nigeria, Pakistan or some other country in the world, it might take estate agents, surveyors, valuers to hand in and also pensions. It's another big yes. thing, getting professionals to assess what one other party might have contributed towards their pension and may have to share, may also be uh, put forward and evidence as to who contributed what within the marriage, especially if there is a dispute. So we're going to take a very short break and after the break we are going to talk about children. So talking about contact, applying for contact and what to do if you're in an unmarried situation and you've been cohabiting and it has broken down. So see you after these few moments.
Okay, welcome back. So we are talking all about family this week. This week it's about family, separation, children, contact, what to do if things are not going right, what to do if, if things are, are really going wrong. Now, children, what happens? Who decides where the children should live? If the couple can't agree during the mediation process, who has the children full time or how they share the responsibility of looking after the children, what should happen? Okay, in situations, uh, it depends. If there is um, issue, if they've got issues of um, domestic violence, then the court will in, um, order or instruct the CAFCAS to carry out their assessment. So CAFCAS is the uh, children. sort of children and families team in the in, in the court service. But to be honest with you, they've been affected by COVID as well. Sometimes they have to talk to people over the phone rather than do home visits. But the court the judge needs to have help in making decisions when there's a level of confusion or the child's views are not being heard because there's two adults that are in disagreement yeah. and if the child is very young you know they would maybe the court would instruct the um the Kafkas to vi visit whenever they're having meetings or the, the one of the parties the court could instruct maybe it depends if there's if there's domestic violence the court will not allow any contacts whatsoever in the interim until they have a report from the from yeah. class. They'll need to do so a really risk important. assessment. Yeah. So the risk assessment may be not just about allegations that have been made and whether they are true or not. It really is down to the risk around the child because the, the court has to act in the best interests of the child. So when it comes down to this private arrangement, is there a fee that needs to be paid? Is it something that... Um, Again, if people can't agree, does one party have to pay for the court to make a decision as to child contact? If it's private, you know, if it's between couples privately, then yes, the, 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 the one of them may have to pay if it's working, if it does not meet the threshold of being able to uh, get legal aid. But if the other party is able to get legal aid, probably because of domestic violence, history or mental health issues, then they, you will not be able to pay and you will not need to pay anything. So you might get help with your fees? First of all, if you're on low income, or you may get help through legal aid. And that might be because of domestic violence, mental ill health, or another reason. But generally, if there's been a history of domestic violence, then you would get um, assistance through legal aid. But does that also lead to abuse of the system? Sometimes Do you see false it, allegations? Sometimes it does lead to abuse because some people will just come in and say, oh, this person has abused me. By the time you check the records or you get the police rec records, you find there have been reports, you know, and there have been reports to the GPs, reports to the police and things like that. So it does lead to abuse. So what about false accusations? Now, we've um, kind of got a reputation or a basic has a reputation for representing men who've been innocently accused of abuse and it's take it does take a toll on people so what would you say is the side effects of false allegations of abuse it's mental health issues it's stressful yes, for people you know, it's really emotionally draining for most people they're so nervous you know sometimes people can't sleep because it has to do with their children mm. personally and if they're not allowed to have contact with their children because of false allegation it could make them forget, you know just bring down their morale mm. you know and various ways and the other thing is it's expensive because it they might not be entitled to legal aid it means they actually have to use their own money to prove their own innocence and have access to their own child so it can be very very stressful and traumatic but let us also look at the issue of um, domestic violence and protections so what protection can you get if you're in a situation maybe you don't own the property that you're living in as a couple can you still get help and protection from the law yes uh, definitely if you um a victim of domestic violence you report to the police they, they will put you in contact maybe with a shelter or with, or with a refuge that could protect you keep you and your, maybe your child and then they you could apply for they'll contact maybe put you in contact with a solicitor or a legal representative that will apply for non-molestation order to prevent the perpetrator from coming close to you and your your child or your family and that injunction can exist not just around property but around your workplace yes. schools and other places that you actually visit because we've had situations where people are more or less being stalked outside of the home 
but because they've been in public when they've called the police, the police have not really known what to do. So if an inj injunction can be quite specific to keep a number of metres and not to attend specific locations. So don't feel afraid to, ha to um, get advice and help on it. What about occupation orders? So these are other orders that might be used for protection. Yeah, so for inst in instances where the couple, they maybe they've always had issues arguing in front of the children or the courts may look at the best interest of the child and decide that look, one of the parties may will have to leave the house and then the other one will remain. So the court will make an order, you know, to say, oh, you can apply for that. You know, so the court can look into it and apply and say, this other person should move out of the house within so, so and so time. Yeah. So just to keep peace in the home and to keep the children safe, you know, in the city. So even if you own the property, yes. it's no right to stay there and abuse somebody. Or even if you're not the perpetrator, for the sake of peace, the court may make an occupation order for one person so that, and, and that might be until there's a fact finding, yes. a finding on the facts and the allegations, but that might be to preserve the peace and to make sure that certain parties are, or and children as said, are protected and have a roof over their head. And if you don't own the property legally, it's not in your name, and maybe you're an unmarried couple, you can have this in place for, I think it's up to nine months. It can be for a long yeah. time, just so that things, the dust settles. Now, Unmarried people, again, might be deterred, think, oh, because I'm not married, I don't have a right to ask for the child, especially men who are, um, the, well, the non-resident parent, if I say it like that, and the child may live with mum, and the dad may have had historic allegations of abuse, which he may deny or may even accept that that was not a good time and did wrong. Can that kind of a person who's even guilty of having committed harm still at a later date come and apply for contact with their child? Of course they can, especially if they have the name of the child in their birth certificates, you know, their parental rights, you know, of the, over the child, they can apply. Mm. And even if they don't have that, they can apply to court for that. So, even if your name's not on the birth certificate, even if you've had a history where you're not proud of it, it wasn't good, but you want to step up and exercise your parental rights, number one. If your name's not on the birth certificate, you can apply to have it put on there and your parental rights to be recognised in law. You can actually apply to have the birth certificate changed, yes. actually. Number two, you can outline that the past is the past and you're a changed person and you want to have contact with the child. The court looks at what's in the best interest of the child and will test your character to see you are not a danger anymore and will assess that. So that's not, you know, just blown under the carpet. It will be looked at, but it won't prejudice you. They will look at what your current circumstances are. Even if the child is old enough, they'll ex take a, a, a snapshot of what the child actually wants and whether the child wants to have a relationship with you. And if you are somebody who can prove that you've been alienated from your child, that is deliberately stopped from having a relationship with your child, again, you can still try and make your application to try and enforce and assert and confirm your parental rights and establish a level of contact with your child. So it's not just about being married. No, no definitely not. And what if you're unmarried and are fighting over property as well the court will they be able to look at such a situation of course they can they do look at it and um the first advice or would give would try and settle within yourself to see if you can come to an agreement on how to split the properties you know depends on who's contributed what yes and it depends on who is the main care of the child if you've got children in the, in the, in the relationship so the court will look at that also and you know, to you know award you Nowadays, there's so many different dynamics within families and nobody judges, nobody's here to judge you as a person. But if you want to assert your right over property that was acquired whilst in a relationship, whether you're in a same-sex relationship, older person relationship, unmarried relationship, it's about separating and separating in a manner that is fair especially if you've contributed towards the acquisition of that particular asset or property or even business. So um, you've got to think about how you get advice around your situation, especially when there are businesses and we find a lot of people setting things up together. Online business is very easy to set up and register together, very easy to do things. But when it's time to separate, it might be a bit complicated 
who owns shares what proportions should they be split are there still roles do you still have to work together does there have to be a level of independent valuing by experts all these things are not so easily done in a conversation it might need an, as i say a mediator and it might need a court to make a final decision with regards to proportions and what is fair based on what was contributed so we're going to have a very very short break now and when we come back in our final segment we're going to be look at general problems around the issue of contact because sometimes even though things are agreed they might not come to pass and what you should do so see you in just a few moments <music> final segment of truth and justice tv and today we're talking about family law so before the break we we're talking about financial separation what to do if you've contributed towards assets within a relationship or marriage and then we were also talking about things that need to be assessed valuations and one of the main things we talked about was pensions so when it comes down to pensions it's quite a, a, a specialized area and uh, at times the the way an accountant or a financial advisor may need to come in and outline to a court what's due to parties or at the final stage of their pension and how it should be split can be complex and until there's a final decision and after a final decision a court will look at how a child is to be maintained up until when is it 16 18 21 so what are some of the issues around that and maintenance um there have been issues where you know I would mention again, probably they've had issues in the family that the mother or the father has moved out of the property or from the family home and the children are left just like that. So they, one, of the, one of the parties would contact the court and say, look, I would like to um, ask that financial settlement be brought into this situation and there's a time limit for that to be brought in. If it's not maybe initiated at the initial stage, you could also redo it. We apply for it after the divorce is completed or concluded. So you could requests for a child benefits to be made yeah. paid to your child directly Interim by contacting payments. yeah mm -hmm. you know con directly contacting the um child um uh, benefit uh, child arrangements um, child support agency child support agency and you could also request for interim payments yes. or you know and then long term payments they could also do you know the court committee or those or that make sure yeah. that they're in place so you it's know, important to, it's really have, important to have children in look outside of your stress look for the financial provision for the child not just for today but until the child does not is no longer a dependent of yours that child might have aspirations to go to university so you might need to have interim payments or lump sum payments when the child reaches a certain age now i did say we're going to talk about contact what do you do if you've got a contact order you've paid you've been to court and you're still not having access to the child or somebody's frustrating the situation. It's quite straightforward. You apply for a variation order. You go back to court and apply for a variation order or for the court to discharge the court order or, you know, if you're not happy with it, you don't have to stay there. You go back to your solicitor or your lawyer to say, look, I need to go back. I'm not happy with this or this person's not complying. So you apply for enforcement as yes. well. So if you're not happy, somebody's frustrating, turning up late, calling you, telling you the child's always sick or the child doesn't want to speak to you, you can go back to court. And I know it can be stressful, but please make sure you do not give up on your parental rights and make your best effort. There are people in court that can also try and advise you if you're representing yourself. So do try your very best. So Viv, as I call you, or Mrs. Akim Banjo, if people want to get hold of you, how do they contact you? Oh, you could contact me on um, Vivian at com, or you just call our office and you'll be in touch with me. We'll be ready to help you. 
and I know oh, she's as calm as a cucumber no matter how turbulent or stressful your situation is she'll give you the most calm professional advice to see you through so thank you Viv for coming to Truth and Justice TV and I hope you'll come back again it's a pleasure you'll, you'll come back and talk to us about litigation yes, <laughs> and thank pleasure. you our audience for being with us once again and I hope this was very informative. You can contact us on 0207 739 at Obaski's Listers or the email you see on the screen. So we'll see you next week. Take care and be good. If you can't be good, be careful. Bye-bye.